Hey guys, welcome back for today's lecture on Wednesday, April 29th, I believe. Um, <clears throat> yesterday we talked about uh, Vietnam, specifically the Gulf of Tonkin and then the Tet Offensive. I hate to kind of cut the Vietnam War into just those two things, but I mean, I'm pressed for time, so uh, those are going to be the two points on Vietnam that we talk about. Now, we'll talk about the end of Vietnam uh, tomorrow, probably, but those will be the big uh, bullet points for that conflict that we'll talk about. Today, we're going to go into a little back to Europe. And we're going to take a trip to the Eastern Bloc. Those satellite countries to the Soviet Union, they're now in there, for many of them, uh, nearly 20th year of you know communism. And there was some dissent in some of those places, some more than others. Uh, countries like Romania and um, Romania and uh, Albania had had some issues with the Soviet Union as well as the Warsaw Pact. But in 1968, Czechoslovakia goes through a reform. A man named Alexander Dubček becomes general secretary of the Communist Party in Czechoslovakia. That is basically their form of president. That's the most powerful individual in that country. And Dubček wants to reform the country. He wants to ease things. He doesn't want to be an over-aggressive dictator. So some of the things he pledges, uh, he gives media, he loosens up on media restrictions. You know, he, he gives freedom of the press. He also wants individuals and businesses to have more power in the economy. He wants to decentralize some of the economy. And though that is something that is totally against the idea of communism. Like that, that itself makes it not communism. And of course, the people of Czechoslovakia love this. Most, like most of them. They're super excited. But all the communists outside of, che of Czechoslovakia, specifically in the Soviet Union, they hate it. So this leads to the Prague Spring, which is you know, the season in Prague. Prague is the capital city of Czechoslovakia. Today it's capital city of the country known as the Czech Republic. Uh, it's, a, always, it's always rated as like one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It's a very, very popular place, very nice to this day. But during this time, it's the site for conflict. And when the Soviets can't convince Dubček to take back his reforms, Soviet and then Warsaw Pact troops, which just means country or soldiers from other countries involved in the Warsaw Pact, they send 650,000 troops into Prague. And Prague had a lot of people that were participating in uh, protests, nonviolent protests mostly, as they were taking a, a, a page out of the playbook of the African American civil rights activists in America at the time. Uh, a lot of people protesting. There were even people performing self immolation. If you don't know what that is, that's purely sitting like in the middle of the street and lighting yourself on fire and essentially dying. Uh, there were people that did that to try and bring awareness to their cause. Uh, tanks rolled through the middle of the city. 
the military uh, forced people back into their homes. You know, they established a, a strict curfew, and Dubček's arrested, and he's replaced as general secretary. Now he's released from prison, but he's basically blacklisted from any Eastern European politics. Uh, he, he stays in Czechoslovakia, but he, he has to get like a regular job outside of government. And the man who replaces him as general secretary of the communist party uh, of Czechoslovakia, he takes back all the reforms. He establishes what they called normalization where they just went back to the way things were before, pretended like the press never had, you know, freedom of press and uh, pretended like the economy never, never had some privatization in it. You know, they just go back to hardline communism. Now the invasion does a lot to harm the Soviets' support. Um, most of Europe was very against it. Albania withdrew from the Warsaw Pact. Like they took themselves out, said, no, we're done. This is, we're not a part of this. We're out. Um, Finland, up in Northern Europe, they were another kind of Soviet satellite state. People in Finland were offended by it. Like they, they thought it was dumb. They hated it. Obviously, the NATO countries thought it was an abuse of power. Perhaps most surprisingly, though, was, and maybe the most angry of any country other than Czechoslovakia and all this, was China. China thought this was a blatant disregard for communism. Now, what's weird here is, you know, China's communist now. But the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, it's no longer Khrushchev, it's Leonid, Bre Leonid Brezhnev. Brezhnev, Khrushchev gets like kicked out of office because they thought he was becoming too soft. They thought he was being too nice. So Brezhnev comes in, Brezhnev's kind of crazy, he's kind of, you know, cold and he's more like Stalin than Khrushchev was. Uh, Brezhnev, says that they will intervene to reform any country's communist party that basically they're going to intervene anytime a country's communism does not reflect Soviet's form of communism. Like they, they want their satellite nations to have the same kind of economy and government as they do. And any of those countries that don't, you know, they're going to invade like they did with Czechoslovakia. Well, China and the Soviet Union had kind of been at odds with each other because their communism is different. China is more militant, like they're more aggressive. They're more, honestly, communist purist. Like, think back to the original idea of communism is it it has to require violent revolution and it requires bloodshed to maintain so china it gets angry with the soviet union because uh they didn't end up launching nukes on america when they had the option to back like during the cuban missile crisis and a few other times every time that it was settled diplomatically china was like you're stupid you should have bombed them well, now they, they see that Czechoslovakia has been invaded because their communist communism is different from the Soviet Union's. Well, China's communism is different from the Soviet Union's. So they think, well, this is just setting them up to excuse themselves to invade us in China. So they, they were very angry. They launched a huge anti-Soviet uh, media campaign. So Prague Spring does damage the Soviets' uh, 
image. Now back in America, we also have a new leader. His name is Richard Nixon. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, I believe could have run for another term, but I think he chose not to. And Nixon wins the election. Nixon issues his plan of Vietnamization. Now this is after the Tet Offensive and everything and, and all belief in victory for the Vietnam War in America is gone. Like everyone thinks we should get the heck out of there and there's enough pressure from the people that governor, government had to take notice. And, when, and Nixon wins the election partially by campaigning on bringing the troops home. So when he gets elected, he, he's in office for like two months. And he announces his Vietnamization plan, which was his plan to, um, first they were going to train and pay and arm the South Vietnamese army. Like train them, better equip them to defend themselves. And then he's gonna gradually withdraw American troops. So I guess I, in the notes there, I listed it kind of backwards. First, he's gotta, he's gotta train and prepare the South Vietnamese forces because the war's not over. South Vietnam has not been defeated and we want them to be able to hold their own. But the way they were constructed at the time, they were not ready to stand by themselves against North Vietnam. So we had to financially support them. We had to train, we had to have soldiers over there that would train their soldiers and their leaders. And then we would eventually just start sending troops home, you know, piece by piece. That was his Vietnamization plan. And he ends up following through, you know, piece by piece, we eventually get American soldiers and troops out of Vietnam. Um, and we'll talk about this a little more, I think, tomorrow. But South Vietnamese forces end up not being able to hold up. And North Vietnam ends up defeating them. But the people back home don't really care. I wouldn't say they don't care. They're not bothered by it. They really just wanted to end this conflict. They wanted to end America's involvement in it because it was something they believed America should have never gotten involved with. You know, there is, it was very controversial. There was a lot of people back home that hated this. Like this, there was no unified back home uh, support for our involvement in Vietnam. There's a lot of backlash, a lot of controversy. <clears throat> In 1969, we have the SALT Conference. SALT stands for Strategic Arms Limitation Talks. They took place in Finland, and it was between the US, Soviet Union, Britain, I think France was probably there. And it was a further de-escalation of nuclear conflict. So they both decide to limit uh, certain nuclear missiles. Uh, if we get in depth about it, it's... They agreed that you, whatever weapons you had currently, that's the maximum number you could have from now on, at least in that form. So however many submarine launched missiles, or however many nuclear missiles that could be launched from a submarine, however many you have, you can never have more than that. Now, if you, if you wanna upgrade them, or you wanna update them or make them better, you can, but you're gonna have to get rid of your old ones. So, and the same with intercontinental missiles that are just set on a base on firm ground. Um, 
You know, you, it wasn't that you couldn't make nuclear weapons anymore, but you couldn't stockpile them. So, like, say you want to get a new phone. That's fine. You can get a new phone, but you have to trade in your old phone for it. You can't keep your old phone just in case. You can't, like, stock up on all these on all these extra phones. You know, you're going to have to trade in. You're going to have to get rid of the old to bring in the new. And that's SALT. This action ends up being SALT 1 because there's a SALT 2 a few years later when they find the need to adapt uh, the rules. But both countries agree to this, and it serves as a further de-escalation, more cooperation between the two countries. And again, China doesn't like it. China thinks the Communist or the Soviet Union is going soft on the U.S. So China doesn't participate in this. So China just keeps stockpiling weapons. And that's the reason why today we see China as a major nuclear threat because they've never had to abide by any of these uh, nuclear arms treaties. You know, it's always been mostly based around the U.S. and Soviet Union slash Russia. That's SALT-1. And as you can see in that picture, it's Brezhnev shaking hands with President Nixon. <clears throat> so cooperation is becoming a, a very important key to uh, this era. We're trying to move on from the tension from the Kennedy and uh, Khrushchev days. So now we get to our essential question, what was Vietnamization? Very simple, had the exact definition on the previous slide. So uh, we'll stop a little earlier today. And uh, we'll call her good. Put that answer on your essential questions document. And uh, we will have a uh, Zoom meeting on Thursday for everybody. Just checking in. We'll have a question today. We'll talk about some things. I'll, I'll try and map out a little bit of what we got left. And then we'll be good to go. So have a terrific day, everybody.